Welcome back to the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives regarding men, women, sex, and love. Today on the show, we're going to talk with Australian writer and commentator Bettina Arndt about the sex-starved husband and other raw deals for men. But first, a couple of quick announcements. First, I'd like to remind you to become a Patreon subscriber. There are four very economical levels, and when you sign up, you get all kinds of perks, such as free ebooks, a shout out on the show, and even a Q&A with me, depending on which tier you choose. All you have to do is go to thesuzannevenkershow.com and scroll down just a bit until you see the Become a Patron button in the middle of the page. It's that easy. Also, due to popular demand, my husband Bill will be joining us here once a month for a new segment I'm calling the Bill and Suzanne Hour. He and I are busy organizing topics to discuss, all related to marriage, of course. And if you have something you'd like to request, you can email us at Suzanne at the Suzanne show.com. Finally, if you're looking for marriage or relationship coaching, just go to my website, SuzanneVenker.com, and click on coaching at the top. When it comes to American women, there is no shortage of attention paid to their needs, their desires, their educations, their careers, and of course, their rights. That is not the case for men. And it is no different in Australia, as Australian writer and commentator Bettina Arndt can attest. Bettina started out as one of Australia's first sex therapists before becoming a respected social commentator on gender issues. After nearly 20 years talking and writing about these issues, she wrote an international best-selling book about sex. The Sex Diaries looked at how couples manage their sex supply, dealing with their ups and downs in sexual desire. 98 couples kept diaries for her, writing about their daily negotiations over sex. Bettina followed this up with an exciting diary project on why sex means so much to men, which led to her book, What Men Want. Since then, alarmed by the unfair treatment of men in our society, Bettina now devotes her time to making YouTube videos and media appearances about men's issues and the anti-male feminist agenda. Welcome to the show, Bettina. Lovely to be here, Suzanne. So great to see you. Um, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> I, I should tell everybody that <laughs> you talk about very serious stuff, you know, like I do, but you have quite the sense of humor. So I'd like to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I've always got away with talking about um, unmentionable topics by introducing that humor. You oh, know? that's a good idea. Uh, I, 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 mean, I suppose particularly, as you, you described, in my early days in relation to the sex therapy, I, I always f- thought you could talk about Sex, very serious and, and potentially very embarrassing topics to do with sex if you could make people laugh. I mean, you could. I, I used to do a lot of public speaking and people would get more and more tense. And if I told the right sort of joke or told a nice, funny little story, they'd all laugh and relax and I could, you know. That's brilliant. No, make some progress. You're you know. absolutely right because we are going to talk about sex, Bettina, and that you were a former sex therapist, which I told people at the um, in the intro. Um, I think a little humor is definitely required. <laughs> so I agree with you on that. Okay, so we're going to start with um, two chapters, uh, two different quotes from those chapters that you sent me earlier from the sex diaries. And the chapter one that you... Uh, sent on that talk about humor is called 50 thrusts and don't jiggle my book. (laughs) We'll have to let everybody sort of let that sink in and maybe let people use their imaginations on what you meant by that. Um, And what was funny about this is you opened with that Annie Hall scene and I laughed because I opened with that exact same scene in my last book under the sex for the part about sex. You want to tell that Annie Hall opening? It's kind of fun. Oh God, I'd have to remember it now. Okay, so and so you tell it. Okay, I'll tell it. So so long. That's fine. So it's you know Woody Allen and Diane Keaton and their boyfriend girlfriend. They live together and they're seeing a therapist. And the therapist says to each one of them on separate occasions. So how often do you guys have sex? And Woody says never, just like three times a week. When it's her turn and she goes to see him, she said all the time, like three times a week. (laughs) The point was. That there's a That's real right. disconnect there between what um, a man and a woman sees as frequency when it comes to sex. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, and it, and it, I mean that was ages ago. Well, how many decades I know. ago was that movie? And but I mean it's been this issue has been getting in my in my perspective, my perspective worse and worse ever since i mean that's when the shift was really occurring back in the 60s and 70s when. Uh, 
we we moved out of an era where sex was part of the obligation, but you know, sex was wifely duty. It was one of the things you expected right. to negotiate in a relationship. To a situation now where women, if women are not interested, it just doesn't happen. And I mean, that's been a, a, a it's a fascinating shift in the power balance in the marriage. It is, and we're going to talk about that. So you wrote in that chapter, quote: "It seems extraordinary that sex is treated so differently from all the other ways in which a loving couple cater to each other's needs and desires." We are willing to go out of our way to do other things to please each other, cooking his favorite meal, sitting through repeat episodes of her beloved television show. Why, then, are we so ungenerous when it comes to making love, which should be the ultimate expression of that mutual caring? So that was where you were, you know, and I know you've talked about this in speeches as well, as this huge shift, as you just pointed out, between your quote-unquote marital duties um, to really what it's morphed into now, which is a completely dysfunctional um, dynamic where women are essentially saying, you know what, I'm not interested, and well, too bad. Yeah, yeah, that's it for the next twenty years, mate. You know, and that that is just extraordinary. I mean, to have a forty year old man write to me and say, she said, no more sex ever again, and I love her, and I love my family. I don't want to break up the family, but the thought of never holding a woman in my arm ever again is unbearable. And I've had hundreds of letters from men in that sort of situation and it's just it's the fact that we as i said you know that we we talk endlessly about what women want from their relationships and how men are not giving women enough not doing enough housework not doing this not doing that they need to do more of this and this is top of most men's lists i mean if you went out in the streets of australia or america and said you know what what's missing for your marriages that's what men would say no not question enough sex not enough sex no question and sometimes I do you know women's men's demands men's expectations are unrealistic we have to say that but very often men just want to have they expected sex to be part of a marriage and they didn't expect to have the tap just turned off of course not and then on top of that expect that they're really supposed to live that way and never go get it elsewhere that's a whole nother you know piece of it yeah, yeah. but but also that, that 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 when she gives gives them sex they're expected to be grateful yeah you know that they they feel that they have to beg for sex and i mean the, she, she that you know that she's handing it out like meat like can't, bites to yeah, a dog. Yeah, right, right. Meaty bites, and you don't know what a meaty bites. Meaty bites is a little dog treat, you know. And that idea that they, that the men from the men, it's so humiliating for men to grovel for what should be part of a loving relationship. No question about it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, with respect to the difference in male and female sexual desire. Uh, one of the other, before we get into that, one of the other things that you talked about, which I like both in this chapter and then I also saw you talking about it in a, spe- in a speech you gave, was the grope, <laughs> this concept of groping. Grope. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you something interesting that happened the other day. Um, well, first, let me just read what you wrote here. You said, it features regularly in so many of the female diaries. Women complain about cringing when their partners cuddle and then their hands wander uninvited across their bodies, touch their breasts, feel and fondle. The grab at the breasts as they pass in the kitchen, the grope under the skirt on the way up the stairs. Now, this is really interesting because, so this is part of what you, you were, you were uh, interviewing people for this book, correct? And you were getting... Well, I had, I had, I had 98 couples who kept diaries for a year. And I mean, just most fascinating thing, writing about how they negotiate sex in a marriage and the grope emerged from that, you know, just women talking about, yes, you know, I don't, you know, sex is fine and so on, but I hate it when he gropes me. I can't stand it when he makes that sort of sexual approach to me. Yeah. And yeah, which was really interesting for me. So I could then, what I then did is took those quotes about the grope and sent it to a group of my men. These people were writing into me every day and I said, well, tell me about the grope. Why do you do it if she says she hates it? And one man wrote back and said, yeah, I know she hates it. I know I'm going to get into trouble, but I can't help it. Uh, and it was about, he was saying how he has to tell her, here I am. Yeah. I still love you. I still want you. Where has she gone, yeah. the lover I married? Yeah. And it was this c- so men were saying to me, it's not about physical connection. It's not about getting their rocks off. They know they can go and masturbate. Mm-hmm. It's not about sexual relief. It's about connection. And 
They don't want to be married to a sister or roommate. They want a lover in their lives and they expected to have a lover in their lives. And to be in this situation without that connection is just humiliating and enormously depressing for men. I've had men, you know, I've talked about this on the radio. Men have rung me and said, I was sitting in the car with tears rolling down my cheeks mm-hmm. listening to you. Because uh, this is the other point that men hardly ever hear anybody talk about this. Because that's one of the other things we're doing. We've made it a taboo to say, hang on, what is going on here? Is this fair to men? You're not even allowed to talk about it without being howled down. I mean, every time I, I wrote about this, I would get you know depicted as some conservative old stick mm-hmm. who wanted to kick – You know, it's all about marital rape. I'm saying that women have to lie back and think of England, that women had to put up with that. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying men and women. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it's the woman who is craving more sex. And in in either case, the person who is being sexually rejected, um, that's a devastating position to be in. And the other person needs to think about the impact of that of that rejection on their partner. No question it about works it. Both ways. I know you yeah. had said originally this was years ago. Basically, your suggestion was coincidentally, by the way, the same as mine. People who follow me know that I've written about this. You basically said just do it to women, even if they are not desirous of it in that particular moment. And you explained why that men and women have different libidos. And typically speaking, it just takes women longer to warm up. But once they're there, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing. It's not like we're asking you to, you know, suffer in some way. So when you said basically just do it, you got lambasted by feminists. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the just do it thing is really important because, you know, I was trained as a sex therapist for 40 plus 45 years ago, and then we thought desire was essential to women's arousal. You know, and Masters and Johnson and all the big researchers were saying, you desire, you need a desire in order to get arousal, in order to get orgasm, and therefore if women didn't have desire, you know, it, sex shouldn't happen. That was the message from, for decades. Mm. And then there's been important research come through, um, from particularly from a Canadian, Rosemary Basson, who did a lot of work with women who weren't experiencing any sexual desire. And she finds that for a lot of women, they don't necessarily need desire in order to get aroused and achieve pleasure. If you put, I always say, if you put the canoe in the water and start paddling, then desire, you know, mm-hmm. and you're with a man who knows go, yeah. how to you have to be with a man who knows how to make love to you properly. Obviously, if he doesn't have a clue what he's doing, you're not going to get aroused. And you also have to have a willingness to be receptive. Mm-hmm. And that's about being in your head saying, okay, I, don't, I know I'm not going to feel like it, but let's just see what – let's put the canoe in and start paddling and I'll see what happens. And many women talk to me about this saying they know that uh, it, once they relax and get into it, they will start to turn on. They don't need desire to start off with. And that once they've had that experience, they can just go with it and if and arouse all usually, mm-hmm. you know, maybe mm-hmm. not always, mm-hmm. but always kick in. And I always say, if it's not working for you, stop. Mm-hmm. I don't think women should have it, of course, if they're not feeling any desire. That's just crazy. Mm-hmm. But you could give make love in other ways. You've yep. got a pair of hands, you've got a mouth, you've got you know, you've got means of giving yep. him pleasure and showing you care about him. But in most many cases, it's about also about her pleasure. Desire will kick in. She will reach orgasm. And then women often say to me, I can't, you know, after that happens, I think, why don't I do it more often? Yes, I, I yes, really yeah. enjoy the, the experience. And I'm, I'm very conscious of how good it is for us as a couple. Yeah, I mean, I, do, to have that I, I can't imagine any married couple not seeing afterward the, the – the incredibly obvious positive effects from that. And it carries for days. And I don't, and I know that women, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking about women that I know for whom this would be the case where there would be sort of a, Oh God, I'm so tired. You know, I, I, it takes so, and to be fair to women, it takes so much more for us. It just feels so unfair. And it just is because men can do it in two seconds flat without all that, without the stage being set just so and I've written about this and that's why unfortunately that's just the way that it is so you're going to have to set up the scene a little bit to make it so that like for example the moment my husband and I are away right when we're not with the kids or if the house is empty which it never is that's the problem (laughs) but we're almost empty nesters we have one year left but if but if he takes him away for the weekend 
I'm a completely different person. I mean, I'm immediately lighter and more receptive and more, everything is just, it feels like it did before, you know? And I, that's not the case when you're in the home with kids. It's just gonna be very difficult. So I, that's why I'm always encouraging people to create the scene first because women do tend to need that. That's right. I mean, it's certainly true that um, if you could get away from the stresses of everyday life, um, and particularly when you've got children, young children, uh, it's it's very hard for women. And a lot of women are enormously overstretched. And there's all sorts of reasons why it's, it's you know, it's harder to light the fire. Mm-hmm. It's like dealing, you know, lighting damp wood. You, you need perfect conditions for that to light. And we very rarely get those perfect conditions. But it's funny, you know, this idea, if I get away from it all, it will happen. Men are always saying to me, well, I, you know, I, you know, this idea of you get away on a holiday, go to, go to Bali or some exotic place. Oh, I've taken her to Bali and nothing happened. Oh, you know? no. It's oh. no guarantee. <laughs> because, because it's all in the head in the yes. end. Yeah. If, if, if women go on a holiday to Bali and they're still resentful, they're still saying, I'm not interested in sex, well, um, it's not going to happen. So that's the other piece of this. So there's there's just the, the logistics of it, which I was sort of describing for a generally happy couple who's pinched for time, which is what I was describing when I was talking about myself. But if you're struggling as a couple, that's a whole different piece of the pie. Because oh. if women feel resentful, it's a libido killer. And I don't mean to suggest that in 22 years of marriage, I've never felt resentful or my husband's never. Of course we have. We're human. So I know that feeling of whatever you're temporarily, hopefully resentful of, it's going to have that side effect. So really to tackle that has to be the first thing to do, ideally. But if it's going on too long, the flip side of that is like you're saying, if you just do it anyway, you really do end up feeling closer. And some of that resentment just sort of melts away. It can. Yeah, that's yeah, I, yeah. Ideally. Yeah. But the problem is, you know, dealing with the other issues, the reasons you're resentful, can divert the whole project. I mean, so many men say to me, we went to counselling. I went with her to a relationship counsellor um, to talk about this issue in our marriage. And we ended up talking about housework because usually it's a female counsellor. Many of those women aren't interested in sex either. Those counsellors, there's a major problem here. I just read and about they, that. Yep. I did. Yeah, yeah, they identify with the woman yep. and they say, yes, yes, if he only did the laundry and why doesn't he know how hard I'm working? And and the whole conversation ends up being around, yeah, being around what he's not doing. And they never get back to six. Well, of course not. And, that's and not, that's not a um, that's not an inducement at all for the him. I know. <laughs> and, and, you know, this idea of doing the laundry will get you laid. No. no mate. I mean, I had one woman one, uh, keeping a diary for me who said she she knows he's trying. She can see from the minute he wakes up, he's working to try to get the green light that night. And he does, he puts the laundry on and he you know, cleans the kitchen floor and he cooks the dinner. And she said, I, I watch him and I'm such a bitch because there's no way he's going to get it. I mean, she was very conscious of her power and the fact that he was trying really hard and she had no intention of giving in to him. Uh, it, was, it was actually pretty horrible. Really rare women actually acknowledge that they're doing it maliciously. In her case, yeah, that's, at that time, yeah. she was. But there's an element of that. Women know that men are groveling. Women know that men are trying to get that green light. And they can choose to ignore it and they can choose to manipulate and they can choose to reward him. If you, you know, if I'll give you sex if you do this for me. I mean, well, let's, it's all pretty horrible. Let's talk about for, it really is horrible. Let's talk about for a second how, well, I want to ask you something. If you, do you feel like if they truly understood what they're doing and what it, what the end result of that is for them psychologically emotionally not physically yes but also big much bigger is, is is emotionally that there's no sympathy for the male libido and understanding that what you're doing is cruel do you think if they understood that it would be different or so they just simply don't understand it or do you think they don't care like from your experience well i think we have a big problem culturally now in that there's such a strong message that it's totally unreasonable for men to be demanding that it's absolutely appropriate for women to just say no if they're not interested. So they have the weight of our culture mm-hmm. at their backs. I mean, women telling them that's perfectly reasonable the way you're behaving. Um, I mean, I, I remember one woman writing for me for a long time whose husband was sleeping in a 
almost a broom cupboard, a tiny little room down the corridor of the, from their bedroom because he couldn't bear sleeping next to her while she was rejecting him. And that had been going on for years. And, and she felt guilty about that. But in the end, she was just absolutely not facing the fact that this was a shocking thing she was doing. I've actually got to know that woman really well since then. And she, she turned around. She started oh, to real, and, and lots of people do. I mean, it's been interesting for me going out, particularly – doing public speaking around this issue. Um, this is all, I mean, I was doing all this work about a decade right. ago, really. Um, and I remember once a woman came up to me after a talk I'd given to a group of lawyers, actually, and and she said she was just watching her husband while I was speaking, and he teared up. Mm -hmm. And she's never in their whole marriage seen that man with tears mm -hmm. in his eyes. And he reached for a glass of water and gulped it all down. And she came to me just shattered, saying for the first time she realised how lonely and miserable he was feeling about this issue. It's just and awful. she's and I've had lots of people who say you you changed my life just oh, just making me think yeah. about what was going on here. But then on the other hand, there's this you know this huge resentment and people. I once had a demonstration at a university in Canberra trying to stop me talking about this. Yeah, I want to talk about that in a minute. Hold on, hold on to that that story because I'm going to get to. Um, I want to get away from the sex and into what you've experienced on college campuses, among other things. But really quick. Well, this was okay. just to add on that. That was in relation to oh, sex okay. where, when I was doing the work on sex. And these university students were saying it was teaching, you know, encouraging rape yeah. um, for me to say to women, just do it. You know, I mean, I, and I, of course, I, I, my point is I'm not saying to women just do it. I'm saying to everybody just do it. I hear you, Consider but I could see how that would not go over well on college campuses. I mean, I know yeah. from experience and having I, talked to that group as well as the 30s and 40-somethings, women are far more receptive to what you and I are telling them when they are when they have been married for some time. Like, in other words, yeah. they have to feel it in their daily lives. I think for college women, it would just sound crazy. I, I mean, I could see how you would have just gotten killed on, in an environment like that. That's my, like my hats off to you. But, but uh, you know, I think there's lots and lots and lots of women who just shut up shop, you know, who give up on sex. They decide it's not really interesting, it's all too hard, and they just don't have sex for Decades and decades and decades. And there, that's an important group for the feminist movement. I mean, one of the interesting things about feminism for me is the fact that they are uh, mobilizing that huge group of women who are pretty anti sex anyway, yes. who say, yes. you know, who, who sneer at their husbands. For if they have them, if they have them, <laughs> yeah, if they still, if they still have right. them, yeah, for wanting sex, and they see it all as part of you know male lust, and they have been, you know, if you look at the key movements in feminism, there's been a strong underlying theme of demonizing male sexuality. Back in the 19th century, the suffragettes had a slogan: "Votes for women, chastity for men," and they had banners saying that. And it was very much part of their initial thrust, if you like, to say we have to rein in male sexuality. And you look at second wave feminism when, you know, we had the, the big push against pornography. We had the big push against, you know, the first objection to Miss, Miss America contests and anything to do with women displaying yeah, their bodies. Right. There was a strong, the male gaze. It was all about nasty, depraved male sexuality being dangerous and, you know, demeaning to women. And that's gone on decade after decade. And it's simply getting worse. And my feeling is they've, they're recruiting this large group of women who, are, who have, you know, and I think there are unfortunately a lot of older women in that group who gave up sex very early in their marriages and weren't interested and used this cultural message to say, I have a right if I'm not interested to just hang up, to hang up my spurs. And, here are the feminists. They're ripe for the picking when it comes to all the feminist um, propaganda. Yes, definitely. Um, well, speaking of these other raw deals for men, I want to get into that because I know that's more in keeping with what you're doing currently. And you just made me think of one thing I was going to talk about, which is the whole sexual harassment debacle and the fact that, like you say, there's this demand for sexual restraint from men, even today, not even back then, but 
that in addition to that, it's simultaneously okay for women to flaunt themselves or to taunt men with the way that they dress today, in addition to expecting male restraint. So it's almost like shoving your body in their face and saying, see, but don't look and don't touch. Yep. And, and there's something wrong with you if I catch you yeah. looking. Yeah. That, that whole, I mean, every mother has been through this, has had a teenage daughter, goes out on a Saturday night wearing, wearing hardly anything. And most of the older generation of women are really pretty uncomfortable with that, not only because it, it may, in our eyes puts them at risk, but I think it's a, I, I, my problem with it is it's a, women misusing their sexual power over mm-hmm. men, flaunting their sexual power over men, going out there and, you know, this whole women can dress as they like and you can just stuff it, mate. I mean, it's not – that's your problem. It's so humiliating for men. And the classic example I always use is we have a princess, Australian princess, who married – a royalty in Europe, she, so she married into royalty, and she was dressed. Mary, her name. She was dressed in a plunging neckline at some official function, and there was an elderly ambassador or someone sitting, ne- older man sitting next to her, who's caught on camera looking down her cleavage, and and then Mary notices and swings over. And sort of glares. adjusts her cleavage yeah. and and glares yeah. mm-hmm. at him, and that video went around the world, sneering at this dirty old man. What year was this? Oh, like, about I don't know. I mean, years and years, ten years okay, ago, okay. something like yeah, something like that. Um, and it would just been shown millions of times that video, oh. laughing at this dirty old man, oh. rather than saying, "What the hell." <laughs> What right? If she, okay, that's fine. If she wants to flaunt her gorgeous tits, why sure, not? Sure, sure. But, but then don't but complain. She can't humiliate someone who caught, who's caught looking. And the reason she humiliates him is he's not in her target audience. It's fine for handsome, good-looking, you know, desirable men. Oh, to of be course, of course. She won't mind that. But if they're too old or too ugly or in some way fall outside that target group, she has the right to make fun of them. And that's just appalling behavior from women. It really is. And I, the way I always describe it is, you know, I ask women, when you're in conversation with a guy, do you want them to want you or do you want them to want your body? If you want them to hear you, what's between the ears, want to hear what you're saying and keep their eyes up here and really take it in, which who doesn't, I mean, who doesn't want to be heard for who they are as a human, then then obviously dressing in that way is going to detract from that. And it's not his fault. You've created that to make him look just like a woman would look. Quite frankly, if your boobs were sticking out, I'm going to look at you too, because I can't help but see him. But the guy isn't going to hear anything you're saying if you do that. So what are you, what's your goal? Yeah. What's it? What is the goal? And the fact that we don't, we never encourage women anymore at all to examine their motivation in that situation. We just simply say, oh, that's fine. You know, yeah. enjoy, do what you like. Uh, and it's all men's fault. And no matter what men do, they're in trouble. If they're caught looking at you, if they're, you know, it, it's classic of the silencing of proper discussion around these critical issues to do with men and women, where I, we're not allowed to discuss what's actually going right. on here. And speaking of them getting, a, they're getting a, a, a not a fair shake. Um, I want to go back to that men's and women's housework issue that you brought up before. And I've written about this extensively. And you and I both know that the total number of hours that men and women work are never discussed. It's always done in a way that made it makes it sound like women are suffering and men are not. Um, and I, my question for you is, do you feel like things are worse in Australia than they are here? Do you, or do you know? Because I've heard well, that it is somehow worse there, but I can't, I, I don't know what that looks like. Well, Australia has become one of the um, the worst countries in the world when it comes to the influence of feminism on our culture and on our public debate and on, all our, our major organisations are absolutely Yeah, captured. that's what I've heard. What do you make of that? Uh, yeah. Why more there than anywhere else? Uh, it's a whole range of things. I think it's partly that we have a, very, we have a tiny population um, in a, in a very big country. The feminists have worked very hard and done very well in Australia and mm. moved into a position of power really quickly with the aid of, 
you know, various political events that happened here. And the history is, is intriguing to work out how, how it happened and how it happened so easily in Australia. But I suppose the classic, some of the people will know about Cassie Jay's yep. movie, The mm-hmm. Red Pill. Yep. Cassie Jay, young feminist um, Former feminist. filmmaker. Former, yeah, yeah. Made this movie about um, men's rights, thinking she was going to go in there and take them on and, and, and show them up for as misogynist, mm-hmm. dangerous, nasty men. And so she does this, uh, films and explores a lot of the issues that they're concerned about and is converted. I mean, she but she finds that there are a lot of genuine issues that are being silenced by feminists, so that, that men are, you know, we're not allowed to talk about the fact that most suicides are male. We're not allowed to put proper funding into investigating why that is. I mean, any number of issues uh, are not, allowed to be publicly discussed so she makes this movie very good movie called the red pill I, sorry i think that's where i first heard about you because she interviewed me she interviewed me and i think she interviewed you too right yeah well she came to australia to to launch this movie where she was doing a speech here um but yeah and she the, when the first screening in australia which was going to be the first public screening in the world was closed down by our feminists and I they remember. banned banned you know they got the 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 cinema the movie Close, yeah. theater to to, to, to ban refuse it. to show yeah, yeah. and then i got involved then in organizing for an organ you know to get screenings all across australia we did this huge we had this huge battle and then cassie came here and i got very involved with her I see. um but that was just a classic example of our feminists are right up there as the most vicious, ferocious in the world. Whenever I see them on the, the, the newscasters in Australia, when I see them on you know YouTube, they're dominated by women and they're all like major feminists. I mean, they are here. That's the funny thing. They really are here too. But it really stands out when you watch those, those yeah. videos. Oh, Australia is now extraordinary. And uh, they do get away with murder. I mean, well, I, the classic example is what's happened to me. I mean, I've been out yeah. for the So tell your story about that. Good. Tell what happened. Tell, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I started off as a feminist. I spent 30 years calling myself a feminist. And then gradually I started to think carefully about this. To me, what happened is feminism, feminism has gone off the rails. I was interested in feminism because it was about an equal playing field. Men and women are having equal opportunities, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that seemed perfectly reasonable. Feminism today is not about that. It's about advantaging women at the expense of men. Uh, and that is a real problem for me. And that when that, when that became really clear, I decided that was an, I've had enough of that. And I got more and more active gradually uh, in talking about men's issues. I've been in writing for newspapers and magazines in Australia all my life. And I used to write more balanced pieces, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, women's view, men's view. And then over the last decade or two, I've thought, blow that. I'm not going to waste half of my words talking about the view that is absolutely prevalent in our society. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna, exactly. And, and when men, men's view Amen. doesn't get a good look. Yep. So I got more and more, it meant what, what many people would regard as strident, but simply presenting the male point of view on a whole range. As you say, this issue about men and women working. I mean, I've written about that dozens of times. The fact that we were that men do just as much total mm-hmm, work mm-hmm. as women do. And the figures have been parallel for decades now. And it, we have our official organizations every year releasing uh, new research, and they only ever highlight lazy men not doing enough to help poor, hardworking women. They only ever talk about ho- housework. They, you know, it's just constant denigration of men. That's just one of hundreds of issues that are treated like that. And so I've I spent the last decade or so talking about essentially men's rights and men's issues and, and what's going and, on here. And what happened and earlier this year? Something happened. This year yeah. I was given an award, which was very exciting. We have an honours system where every year you have to be nominated, people nominate you, and then a committee decides whether you, you get a, this award. And I, I so Order of Australia, it's called. And the language, which was pretty provocative, I mean, we, I had, was part of that negotiation of how they would describe me. They wanted to talk about the sex therapy work. And I said, that's 40 years ago. I don't want to be defined in terms of that. And what I'm interested in, what I'm working for is men's, men's rights. rights. Mm-hmm. So, um, so we, they, they gave me the award for promoting gender equity through advocacy for men, which I thought was totally accurate. Okay. But they, 
the feminists went ballistic. And within hours of my award being announced, we had our attorney general, the chief legal officer of one of our states, saying my award should be rescinded and promoting lies about me, um, saying that I undermine victims of rape mm-hmm. and, and domestic mm-hmm. violence. Mm-hmm. I mean, all mm-hmm. sorts of misinformation. There was a whole orchestrated campaign led, interestingly, by a, a campaigner for end rape on campus. Um, that's been one of my major mm-hmm. areas in the last decade. Like America, we have campus kangaroo courts. We have adjudication of rape cases on campus with, in, in using regulations which are totally prejudiced against the accused, which deny all normal legal rights mm-hmm. to the accused, and young men are being thrown out of university, uh, having their lives ruined by secretive committees making decisions and have no oversight. Um, and I, so I, about two years ago, decided to go out on campuses speaking out about this, uh, which was very interesting. Uh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> you know, here I am, an old grandma, <laughs> and confronting these r- crazy young students. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they went nuts. I mean, the very first, first university where they were, I announced this was going to happen. The university turned around and said that went against the values of the university and I wasn't allowed to speak. And then, of course, we used the media to jump on them and they retreated. But, they, you know, they bashed on the doors. They tried to stop people getting in. They, um, and then, then the next university, Sydney University, they were really violent, nasty protesters who blocked the entrance to the to the – where the venue where I was giving my talk and shoved and pushed the kids who were trying to get through to my talk. Uh, and we had to call the riot squad in to protect me and to remove them. So, And that was amazing because that led to a um, to a whole the government ordering a free speech inquiry about, into free oh. speech on campus and new regulations being put in. Oh. So, I mean, all right. So mix. there's a reason for but, all that suffering. <laughs> now, the point was, the point is I was getting somewhere. Yes. We also had a big court case which determined that universities have no right to um, adjudicate rape on campus. That's oh, now wow. being appealed. Oh. But that was a, so this was all late last year. Okay. And in January, so I was getting somewhere. I was over the target. Yeah. And then, in January, this was announced, and they took me out. Mm. And every and so this was a whole campaign where they released carefully edited mm-hmm. bits of my videos mm-hmm. made mm-hmm. to make me look as crazy and backward and, and all the rest. Yeah, yeah, as possible. They released, you know, they took sentences out of here and bits out of, and misrepresented my whole life's work. And that was in every media organisation in Australia promoted that rubbish about me. I started to try to speak out on interviews. The, the activists used feminist lawyers to send legal letters to say they were going to sue if, they, if I spoke out about what was happening. And so they shut me down my media access. Uh, and it went on and on and on. And then they took stuff that I was tweeting. And I, I, I used to be very active on social media, but everything I put on social media was distorted. And in the end, they managed to get the government to condemn me. Um, it was just over one particular issue. I mean, it went on and on. And but the worst thing for me is they, um, my uh, family came under attack. Oh. And at that point, I said, "That's it. I'm out of here." Um, and uh, since then, that was three months ago. And I'm not doing any public. Yeah, interviews I think in that's Australia. when I first got with you, and you, you, you uh, weren't. I was in. Yeah, was I just, didn't know all that was going on at the time when I. Yeah. Cancelled. Being cancelled is. It, I mean, this is we're seeing it everywhere across the world. I did now. a I did an episode with Heather McDonald two weeks ago on cancel culture. Yeah. So you are now officially part of cancel culture, officially. Oh, no it, question, no question, and it's the most extraordinary experience. I mean, I it bet. really is, because um, I mean, you get very isolated. A lot of your friends don't contact you because they start to believe that yes. the misinformation speak. It's re- really devastating. And I found it extremely difficult. Um, but anyway, so I made the decision to pull out just to retreat for a while and not do any interviews in Australia, not do any social media in Australia. I, but I'm working on big projects up okay. behind the scenes. I've got, and, and during that period, I mean, the, 
the, okay, there was this barrage of people saying I should have my award taken away from me. But they, the, the, this is the Governor General got just as many letters from people saying I should keep my award, you know, absolutely defending me. And they've been sitting on it for six months now, not mm-hmm. knowing what to do. And they haven't made a decision about the award yet. And they can't, I don't think they can, not that I care, but I don't think I, they can remove it because they, I need to have committed a criminal yeah, offence, sure, really. Sure. To, to, uh, so I don't think that's going to happen, but they're just stalling. Um, anyway, uh, I've got plenty of work to do. I've got, I've got 2,000 people on my mailing list, most of whom want to help me, and volunteers helping me oh, with all sorts excellent. of projects. Yeah, so that's all, all right. Me. So that was yeah, that was an awful experience, and I'm sorry that happened to you. The only uh, the only thing I can say is, as you know, it's happening everywhere. So it certainly isn't personal, you know, to to Bettina Arndt. It's it's yeah, a yeah. massive, massive social mess in the West, right? Um, so just to go back for for a little bit to men, and um, of course we know the education. We kind of covered that the education system. Uh, well, with respect to the myth of rape culture and all that, you touched upon that. But you also, I know, talked about, first of all, the anti-male nature of universities, which I've covered on this podcast before, and so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But you mentioned something about women's studies. <laughs> and I thought of um, my conversation with Jordan Peterson's daughter a few weeks ago, Michaela, who had, she came across my book, The Flip Side of Feminism, when she was in university in around 2011. And she noted that the the women's studies messages that you that we all know goes on, which is they should really just call it feminist studies. I don't know why they call it women's studies, but at any rate, that same message and that same propaganda that women are being fed in those classes actually occurs in the um, humanities, in social yeah. sciences. All of it's in other words, it's pervasive throughout. It's no longer just women's studies. It's almost like you're getting women's studies, whether you study women's studies or not. There. Yeah absolutely influencing young women and, and converting them to a certain ideology. No question. Which has huge political repercussions. I mean, they can, And personal, it's the and personal of, too. Yeah, but, and personal too. But, yeah. but it, I, I once did some research looking at um, the difference in political attitudes of males and females going through universities. And that we have wonderful data here showing that Males tend to come; they come out a little bit more left wing when they after you know going into into college and then re- emerging from college. But most of them still do. A lot of them still do STEM subjects, which are r- relatively yeah. immune from all of this. Yes. Uh, but it's the women. Women yep. do a dramatic shift in their social attitudes, and they could measure it on all sorts of questionnaires and so on, showing there's this big shift towards left wing attitudes at after they leave university. So this. This is creating enormous – it's very powerful thing. Extremely, for, e- extremely. For the Democrats, for yes. the left-wing parties across the world. And then look what happens to, the, to women. Women go into jobs which are mainly the service industry, which, where this ideology is still absolutely rampant, jobs where, which are dominated by women, mm-hmm. if you talk about feminism. Mm-hmm. Um, they work in – you know, there's all sorts of reasons why women tend to maintain that allegiance, that left wing uh, allegiance yes. throughout their lives. It's this idea that most of us become more conservative as we get older. Yep. Doesn't apply to women. Nope. Uh, Not today. Clinging to their, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I tell you what, the conservative parties need to look at that. If they w- want to ever have a hope of maintaining power in the, in the world, you know, the years to come, they have to do something about the universities. Oh, oh, no question about it. In fact, I said I have a piece coming out soon that, you know, if you the only way that they can I I was talking more about the money aspect of it, but I did refer to also not only is it insanely expensive, but you're paying basically to be indoctrinated. And the only reason they can charge those prices is because people pay them and they go into debt to do so. You cannot do that and go to your local state school for a quarter and eighth of the price if you want to. So it, they can only do what they can do when we allow it, I guess is my point. So yeah. you're yeah. absolutely right. Until we start there, nothing will change. I mean, I don't think anything politically will at all. And I know that Jordan Peterson's also um, uh, emphasized this. That, that it, it, In fact, he sent me an email recently where he said, I, I'm afraid, referring to some article I'd written about the family, that unfortunately the universities have essentially ruined us. And that I mean, he didn't even get so optimistic as to say that we have to begin there to turn it around. But I know that's what he was kind of referring to, that there's only, that's the place to start. 
you know, and yeah. the only way to do that is to not send your kids there. I know. Oh. I know. Uh, it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. That, you know, it's, and, then, and of course it starts now in schools, this, this indoctrination yeah. of children. Yes. We oh, yeah. All... Younger. Way younger. Yes. But way younger. Even yeah. in my kids went to but... Catholic school and it's even there, Bettina. I know. We, I have a, a, a young man wrote to me who was a teacher who just done a, a master's research on um, looking at the cr- school curriculum in his state in relation to child protection. So they have courses in schools teaching kids to look after themselves and, you know, not to go off with strangers, all yeah. that sort of stuff. Um, talking to them about danger, all sorts of personal danger for them. It was all anti-male. He went through all the curriculum from kindergarten, you know, the very first years of school right to the end of school. Every, I mean, there was only about, you know, less than 1% of the examples used showed a woman in any way being aggressive to a man. All the examples were males, nasty males being dangerous. And that's, that's what our kids are being taught. And that's a good segue into the complexity of domestic violence or spousal abuse yeah. and how... Um, the assumption, of course, is that women are victims of men 100% of the time, and we know that it's really more like 50-50. Let's, let's talk about why that is, because I think there's, you know, when people think about abuse, they think specifically of, you know, physically, you know, harming somebody, like like hitting them, uh, shooting them, choking them, or something physical. But there is a whole arena out there of abuse that women are very skilled at that doesn't involve anything necessarily that physical, although it can, but there's, there's a whole subset um, beneath the surface that, that, that goes on that does not get addressed because, well, for a lot of reasons, men don't want to talk about it or tell people, but also um, we don't acknowledge that unless there's something overt there, like you've shot them, that there's anything going on. So can you address a little bit about about the disconnect there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, it's that's certainly true. I mean, I've always said that the women are past masters at emotional abuse. We know yep. what buttons to press. Yep. We know how to drive him totally crazy, yep. uh, and we everybody knows that. If you look at the, you know, people always talk about the way girls behave in the playground, <laughs> the way little girls mm-hmm. bully. You know, it is it is a known in our society that women can be really cruel, and we, and somehow we have to pretend that's not part of yep. emotional abuse, when it, uh, domestic violence, when it comes to women's behaviour, and yet it's happily included in in domestic violence when it comes to women as victims. But in terms of the physical violence, the evidence is really clear that women are more likely to instigate physical violence than men. That's what's coming out. We've had well over 2,000 peer-reviewed studies now which show that and that, you know, they, 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 it, most violence, most interpersonal violence is two-way violence involving violent couples. And let's explain and, what that looks like, Bettina, because I think that's hard for some people to get their heads around because they think of women as this, and well, of course, they are the, technically the weaker sex. So we're talking about things like throwing plates, kicking, right? Um, there are yeah. a lot, there's a whole litany slapping of things. Him across slapping the him, right. Slapping him, right. And that 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 is a seen as a joke. Yeah, I remember watching Suits, you know the um, the the TV series. Um, oh yeah, I never and, saw it, but I know what you mean. Yeah, uh, I think the seventh time I was counting them, the seventh time a woman slapped a man on the, on across the face, and it was seen as a joke. I gave up watching that show, mm. and it, that's just everywhere. This is a perfect, perfect example. Behavior. Perfect example. A woman gets angry, it's fine. Yeah. Just give him yeah. a whack. Yep. Um, but that sort of so we. And the tr- trouble is, once once they, the couple gets into hitting each other, it's much more likely she'll get injured than him. His greater strength means that yeah. women are more vulnerable, and that and that tends to come out in the stati- statistics too. But plenty of men. We've got very good data on our emergency wards. People turning up with with domestic violence injuries. Just as many injuries from males, um, yeah. women, males, male victims being injured as there are females. Um, oh, the whole, I mean, the domestic violence industry, and it is an industry, has been quite extraordinary because it, it, this has demonstrated the power of feminism more than any other issue. And the deliberate yes. manipulation of an issue. Do you know about you know who Erin Pizzi is mm-hmm. in yep. Britain? Erin Pizzi is this famous campaigner, <laughs> a wonderful woman, 
um, who was for the first woman to set up a refuge in Britain for female victims of domestic violence. And she, when she set up this refuge, she found lots of the women there were violent, were violent to their children, were violent to other men, well, other, other, other women in the refuge. I mean, not all, but a significant proportion. And she started speaking out about this and saying women can be violent too. And the feminists went yep, bananas. Oh, yep. They took her down. Her do- yeah, yeah, her dog was killed. She was threatened breast death threats she had to leave britain for a while and she's been speaking out for over 40 years Mm -hmm. about how feminism took that issue and it was their big cash cow they realized when they were starting to lose after their initial wave of enthusiasm for the women's movement in the 1970s they were losing some momentum and they seized on domestic violence as the best opportunity they had for an issue which no one could touch no one can speak out about this issue because everyone knows it happens everyone knows it's a really important issue protecting women for violent men Mm -hmm. and they have absolutely controlled the dialogue regarding that issue and across the world researchers who do proper research on domestic violence showing how many men are also victims lose their funding Mm -hmm. they have tax on them they just this a few weeks ago i had a a letter from a PhD researcher in Britain who's doing research on male victims of violence. She was threatened by an academic in Australia who's made it, built his whole life on promoting uh, feminist views on domestic violence. And that he came to her department and threatened, uh, spread all these lies about her, um, contacted the head of department trying to stop her funding. I mean, this is a very tightly controlled oh, very. industry. Oh, very. And they yeah. won't. And, and they use, you know, uh, so that, uh, I've been attacking them for years and years and years. That's why, that, you know, they see me as so dangerous because yeah. most people know the truth. I mean, everybody knows there are dangerous women out there. I mean, I all the time hear from people who's, who had a mother who was violent. The people, Children are more likely to be abused by mothers yes, than the fathers. Yes, that's right. Oh, absolutely. Um, especially girls, emotional. but yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. either. And that, and that was Aaron Pezzi's story. She was very open about that, that she had had a very yeah. abusive, she con- had a violent, violent mother. mother yeah. And that's how she came and to, then, yeah. You know, we know, we know women are out there. This whole fuss over the COVID-19 and the, you know, the lockdown and how women were, go- they got a huge amount of funding from all across the world because they use this argument about, um, oh, women the way getting, women getting best, stuck at home with their, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, the hell do we really not believe there were children in those fa- locked up families who were really at risk from their violent mothers we know there are women on ice we know there are women on drugs we know there are mentally ill women who are dangerous how come we have to pretend that's got nothing to do with domestic violence you know oh bettina we could go on and on seriously i could have yep. you on for another hour there's so much to talk about this has really been awesome I really appreciate your coming on. And well, I'd love to talk to you again. And, I, and there are other things I want to, I meant to talk to you about, but we didn't even get there. No, let's do it again. Let's definitely do it again yeah, I'd love to. because I would love to do that. Tell people what these projects are you're working on and where um, they can find out more about your work. Well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm doing some of them fairly, they're a bit secretive at the moment. They're all about okay. promoting, promoting pro- equity for men and women. Um, but, uh, I'm still working on the university issue, trying to expose what's happening in our universities in relation to this. Um, and, yeah, I've got a whole lot of other stuff. I, if people would like to go onto my website and they can sign up to my newsletter and I promote there what I'm do, working on at each. Well, I know, know a lot of my listeners will want to do that because they're, they're always begging me to have more and more um conversations about exactly the type of thing we were talking about today so I, we really do have to have you back tell people that website and spell it out for me so they well just by name it's just under my name it's so if they google bettina aunt b-e-double-t-i-n-a and then a-r-n-d-t uh they will find me and you'll find my website and it's and there's a notice on the home page where you just have to sign up and you'll get my newsletter awesome and then and then if they want to contact us to be one of my volunteers, I'd love to have them on board. Oh, excellent. I know they'll love to hear that. I'll probably hear from them and they'll say, when is she coming back? you gotta, you got to talk more. So um, <laughs> we'll be in touch for sure, Bettina. And thank Good you bad. so much. So nice to talk to you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. When you got married... 
things were perfect. You were both in love and life was good. Then somewhere along the line, everything changed. She changed, or maybe he did. Either which way, now your relationship feels, well, hard. I coach husbands and wives who feel lonely, disrespected, or misunderstood in their relationship. So many women today are desperate for their husbands to step up to the plate, to make a decision and to stick to it, to lead rather than to follow. Ladies, you have the power to make it happen. Men respond best to women who are grounded in their feminine core. As for husbands, so many of them want their wives to stop nagging and to just trust them, to smile more and to complain less, to look at them the way they did when they were first dating. Men, you have the power to make it happen. Women respond best to men who are grounded in their masculine core. The secret to lasting love rests in the masculine-feminine dance. Once you master it, your relationship will no longer be difficult. You'll be moving with the biological tide rather than against it. And that makes marriage smooth sailing. If you're struggling in your relationship, if you feel frustrated or alone, I can help. Just go to SuzanneVenker.com, that's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com, and click on the coaching button at the top. Don't wait another minute to acquire the mindset you need to find love and to sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneVenker.com. And now for the email of the day. This is from Chris. It's just a comment, not a question. Dear Suzanne, I am a happy husband and a somewhat new dad. Three kids, ages six and under. I simply wanted to take a moment to say thank you for not being politically correct. Your wisdom and healthy advice has been a blessing to our marriage. I read your blog, Never Stop Wooing Your Wife, and it hit me in a good way. I'm quite a romantic, and I love to woo my wonderful wife, but the busyness of life and the craziness of raising two boyish boys and a girly girl and all their never-ending needs take a lot of our time and attention. I read your post, and it was the perfect reminder of how much I love my wife, of how crazy I am about her, and of the fact that I've sadly showed her very little in romantic ways how much I cherish her. So as of three days ago, I started flirting with her again, and I made a point to look at her in the eyes the way I used to when we were engaged in newlyweds. As a result, she's been sweeter than usual, intimacy has been spicier than usual, and the overall harmony and love between us is blossoming again. Thank you so much, Suzanne. May God continue to richly bless you and your family. Thank you very much, Chris. I just wanted to share that with everyone because that email meant a lot to me. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to tune in next week when we talk to Sue Ellen Browder, author of Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. Don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook. Just type in The Suzanne Venker Show in the Facebook search bar and you'll find it. Also, please recommend this podcast to one friend you think would enjoy it. And don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you have a question or comment for me, you can email me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week. 